With the weather warming up, you might be starting to think about exploring the great outdoors and going on an adventure. Perhaps our next guest might provide some inspiration. James Hooper is a British adventurer, researcher, and a Korean TV personality. He climbed Mount Everest at the age of 19, completed the first ever non stop journey from pole to pole using only human and natural power, and has biked through much of Korea, Europe, and other places for his non profit One Mile Closer. He's completing his doctorate on Earth and Environmental Sciences in Australia, but he was kind enough to stop by the studio while in a, on a visit to Seoul. Welcome to the show, James. Well, thank you very much. So first, how does it feel to be back in Korea? Uh, it's always lovely to be back, um, you know, see my parents-in-law and my friends. So, um, yeah, no, it's um, the last time I was here was in February and it was pretty cold then. So right, um, right. I, I'm enjoying the fact that it's got slightly warmer in the last few months. <laughs> <laughs> So you've had a remarkable life and it's hard to know, you know, what to cover and where to begin, especially in the in the short time that we have. But let's start with that, uh, those early feats in your life, climbing Mount Everest, the youngest Brit to do so, along with your friend, uh, journeying pole to pole, you know, from uh, from North Pole to South Pole, you know. I mean, how was that? You know, what's more challenging, going to the top of Mount Everest or traveling around the world in in uh, in just human power? So I guess for me personally, the 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 greater achievement would have been going from pole to pole mm. um, just because it was so varied. Um, you know, we had to ski, uh, pulling sleds. We dog sledded. Uh, we sailed across, you know, oceans with mountainous waves, um, cycled the length of the Americas, you know, meeting new people and, you know, every day going through mountains and deserts. And so, you know, it was just really varied. I think with climbing Everest, it's a very defined challenge. Um, yes, it's tough. You know, yes, there are challenges to overcome, uh, but you're in one place and you kind of your goal is very uh, defined in many ways. Uh, whereas going from pole to pole, you never quite know uh, what the environment or the weather's going to throw at you the next day uh, or who you're going to meet. Um, mm. And so it was very rewarding, but also very tough. We're not going to go into the, all the details of these adventures, but I guess the question everyone asks is why? I mean, what drives you to do these uh, feats, especially when you're that young? Most people think maybe one day they'll go on an adventure. What do you think was different about you that made these dreams a reality? Um, that is a, it's a difficult question. I think uh, a big part of it for me was having the encouragement and the opportunity to be able to do it. Um, at my school, there was a cycling club um, and there was a teacher that run the, ran the cycling club. And I guess that gave us the opportunity and he would encourage us and, and uh I guess, compliment us for our cycling. So you <laughs> would, you know, gradually gain confidence. Mm. Um, and then, of course, having like-minded friends around you. You know, I think had it just been me, y you probably wouldn't just go out by yourself for a bike ride at the age of 14 or, mm. or you know, however, I, yeah, I think that's when I started. So, um, but obviously, if you have a friend and you're like, oh, let's go and do it together. Let's, you know, go and have some fun and ride around the local lanes and then maybe stop for a stop for a hot chocolate in the in the cafe or something like that. You know, all of a sudden it's easier to do because you're doing it with, you know, someone that you enjoy being with and, and doing an activity that you love. So those were the really key things for me, having the opportunity, having the encouragement and having, you know, a friend or a few friends that um, that were kind of keen to do it together. I also feel it's your uh, hard work and focus, though, that would have made these things possible. Uh, without that base, I mean, you, you can't do the preparations to to do this, right? Yeah, I mean, I guess I was. I think I was watching a, a movie yesterday, and it had that famous uh, quote by uh, John F. Kennedy. Um, you know, we we don't do these things because they're easy; we do them because they're hard. Mm. Um, and I think you know that obviously resonates that. A lot of the reason why we why we challenge ourselves is because we want to achieve something and we want to feel that, you know, amazing feeling of I did it, you know, I got there and, and the kind of confidence and the warmth and, you know, the success that that makes us feel. Mm. And of course, if it was an easy thing, then everyone would be doing it and you wouldn't feel that special. Mm. So I think everyone likes to find a challenge which is a bit different, which is a bit unique. Um, you know, and go for it because because it is hard and because, you know, if I achieve that, I'll have done something special. Now that you've had several years to reflect back on this, it's been 10 years now uh, since some of these uh, kind of ventures. How does it feel when you look back on them? Do you think these achievements, do you see them differently in, in, in the in the light of day now? Um, interestingly, I think I think I do uh, to some degree. I think at the time you're very caught up in what you're doing and, and really you're just thinking... I guess just about the adventure itself and I think as time has passed I'm now able to look back and I guess look more at 
Um, the other things that you learn through being on an adventure, you know, the cultural side of it, you know, meeting different people and, you know, trying to speak different languages, mm. um, the logistical challenges, which you just get on with at the time. But when you look back, you think, oh, that was that was quite a feat to like put all of that together. Um, I think my appreciation also for the people around me mm. um, who helped, you know, there were people inevitably, you, know, you never can do these things completely alone. Mm. You know, even if it's you that's doing the actual task, there's always a group of friends and family around you who are, you know, helping you make phone calls for sponsorship or, um, you know, feeding you after you've been out training for a day or, you know, <laughs> whatever it happens to be, you know, mm. supporting you, meeting you at the airport or taking you to the airport at 3 a.m. to get on a flight, which you probably shouldn't have booked. Um, and so... That's the thing, I think, when you look back, you're like, wow, you know, I really was lucky to have a group of supportive people around me because mm. without them, you know, it wouldn't have been possible. One of the names we haven't mentioned is uh, your friend uh, who uh, this is, we you know, let's deal with it now. I mean, it's, it's a very tragic event what happened to your friend who was one of your key uh, people that, you know, supported you that you did together. Yeah. Uh, that, I guess, was a real turning point. Uh, for your life, right? Yep. So um, my, well, I guess my mountaineering adventures, including Everest and traveling from pole to pole, I did with my best friend from school. Uh, uh, he's called Rob Gauntlet. Um, and, you know, he was a really an amazing person. Um, he was one of those people who had like that charisma about him uh, and that energy that just made you kind of want to hang around with him. You know, he <laughs> everyone kind of liked spending time with him because he was that kind of passionate, energetic person. And, you know, without him, there's no way that I would have gone and done these adventures. It was having someone who inspired me and like I was able to bounce off. You know, our personalities were slightly different. He was, I guess, slightly more of a go-getter and I was a bit more conservative and safety conscious. Um, but that was the dynamic that worked for us. Um, and, you know, and, and obviously doing things together, we were able to do some some amazing adventures. But yeah, of course, um, uh Having done pole to pole, we uh, came back to the UK um, and we went climbing in the Alps uh, with some friends. And both Rob and another friend of mine, uh, a school friend, um, they fell and they died. And, you know, it was one of those moments where, you know, it's very difficult to describe. You just feel like you've fallen into a black hole and, um, you know, you lose the people who are who are closest to you. Um, and, yeah, I mean, I guess initially I didn't really know what to do. Um, and I ended up working in London for a year and just because I needed to kind of sort my head out and, mm. and actually that was the beginning of the journey which led to me coming to Korea and doing my undergraduate degree here. I wanted a fresh start. I wanted a new challenge in, in a place where I was going to be completely independent. Um, that was important for me um, just to see if I could do it, see if I could, you know, start all over again. And that's that in a way was a gift that career gave to me. You know, I, one, one of the reasons I'm so fond of career is because it, it was where I found myself again. Mm. Um, I mean, climbing Mount Everest and you know, going from pole to pole is an adventure, but then also moving to a different country and starting a new life is a different kind of adventure. Exactly. Yeah. And then, so how was that when you came to Korea? Like, you know, do you know much about Korea? I mean, what was, what was it? What did you have culture shock when you came in? Um, so, uh, yeah, well, I mean, when I came here, interestingly, I didn't initially have culture shock. It was more the longer I spent here that, you know, on the surface, things seemed very similar. You know, it was very mm. convenient to go to, you know, a, um, a corner store and, and, you know, buy some crisps or, or chocolate or, you know, whatever it was. And it, it was more the more subtle parts of the culture, mm. um, which I don't think you appreciate until you actually start to integrate yourself. Those were the more uh, difficult things to deal with. So, you know, a more hierarchical society, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, I guess less respect in some places for personal space. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, these are things, you know, or uh, in the UK, we, we often are very polite on the surface, um, you know, in terms of saying, oh, sorry, thank you all the mm -hmm. time, but maybe it's not necessary. Um, and so when you first are in a situation where maybe someone bangs into you and, and you, you're expecting <laughs> to hear a sorry yeah. um, and that doesn't happen, you know, you're like, oh, that's, that was a bit rude. But, but actually, you know, after a while you start to realize, OK, you know, it's not necessary to do that. But then that's just because, you know, people here, they're they focus their politeness on yeah. other areas, yeah. you know, which we don't in the UK. It's different cultural uh, mentality, just different way of thinking. I understand exactly. that as well. Uh, but then uh, most people in Korea will know you as a TV personality who was on one of the most popular shows on cable TV for a long while. 
it was called Non Summit is the English title, yep. Jung Sang Hedam. And, you know, all these people who were on there were speaking fluent Korean. And you came here, you, you picked up Korean fluently, which is a very, again, another difficult task that you managed to achieve. I mean, first, let's talk about your Korean. How did you achieve that? Um, so I, I went to university uh, in Seoul. Um, and I guess, yeah, my, I studied geography. And uh, yeah, I, I guess it was a Korean university. And, uh, you know, yes, that some subjects were offered, um, some courses were offered in English, but um, probably only about 20 to 30 percent. So I tried to do as many of those as I could, <laughs> um, try and take the easy route. Mm. Um, but of course, a lot of my subjects and, and courses were, were in um, Korean. And obviously, my friends were Korean. So I had to, if I wanted to have a social life, if I wanted to, you know, have fun, if I wanted to understand what I was learning, you know, it, obviously, it was a prerequisite to, uh, to be able to speak Korean. And so, you know, of course, it took time. You know, in my first year, um, you know, it, it, I wasn't great. And then I, obviously, my undergraduate degree took four years. Uh, and towards the end of that, you know, I was starting to become more and more confident and, and better at the language. But that was one of the most satisfying things for me because I started to realize how important understanding a language is as a key to culture. Mm. Um, you know, I think, I think being able to speak Korean unlocks uh, a lot of things about Korean culture, which maybe mm. you wouldn't understand or appreciate if, if you weren't speaking to people in Korean. And, and that was really rewarding. And then appearing on TV, speaking in Korean, that must have been quite nerve-wracking as well. I was terrified to begin with. <laughs> I, think, um, I remember, um, you know, I, I think uh, on the first the first filming thing, you know, we, we all got uh, shepherded into this studio. And I think I was, there was the, one of the Canadian members called Guillaume. And I was speaking to Guillaume and he was like, oh, don't worry, I've done something like this before. And, you know, you get used to it. It's OK. And I was sort of shaking and nervous and, <laughs> and you know, uh, oh, what's going to happen? And uh, yeah, I mean, it actually turned out to be a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun on the set. Um, you know, there were the first the first filmings went for it because we were all new to it basically mm -hmm. you know it took a long time for people to realize what they should be doing so you know for a, a one hour episode we were in the studio for eight hours right, right. <laughs> so it was a long time but but mm -hmm. you know that leads to some camaraderie and um yeah it was just constantly people making jokes and obviously i mean i'd love to see the off cuts <laughs> so you were you know in korea studying korean and, and geography and uh, uh but that's not, again, you weren't just a student. You set up a charity as well during that time as well, One Mile Closer. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, so um, after my friends uh, died in 2009, um, I guess we decided that, uh, you know, as a group of friends and, and family, that we didn't want to, our friends to kind of lose their impact on the world. Um, you know, uh, Rob and also our other friend, uh, also called James, um, you know, they're both really passionate people who were, you know, they loved the outdoors, um, they loved cycling, they loved, you know, having new experiences and learning. And we thought, wouldn't it be so good if we could share that passion and share their story with other people and try and use their memory and their influence to uh, inspire and encourage other people to take up adventure? Mm. And hopefully to you know seize opportunities that that are available for them, or even to create opportunities. Um, and so we decided to set up uh, one mile closer, and we started running um, fundraising cycle rides. Uh, and so, I guess the three aims of that were to share uh, our our friend's story, to um, provide the opportunity and and the uh, I guess circumstance for people who had never really done an adventure before to do an adventure as part of a group and hopefully gain the confidence to then you know obviously later do their own adventures, and finally to to raise money uh, which we decided to um, spend by building a school in Uganda um, in memory of of Rob. And I guess the idea there was, is, you know, both Rob and I felt very lucky to receive a, uh, an education. We went to a charitable school, um, which meant that we had an education which we otherwise would never have been able to afford. Mm. And we thought, well, that, that was critical for us in giving us the opportunities that we had. And Is that school built now? Yeah. So um, in, in, I guess, when we first selected the school, which I think was in 2010, um, uh, there were a couple of teachers and they were teaching, I think, three pupils beneath uh, a row of mango trees. Mm. And um, uh, then we we started working with them and gradually the scores has expanded. Uh, and now I think there are... We went out there a year and a half ago now to uh, to film a documentary that we were making about the school. And 
um, yeah, there's 12 classrooms, there's three dormitories, there's a science lab, um, there's, some, there's a whole lot of teachers' houses so that teachers can live on site. Um, obviously, latrines, which are mm. super important. It's one of the things you don't necessarily understand mm. how important it is to have toilets at a school. You know, if, would you go to school if there were no toilets at your school? Of and you, course not. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, so they were the first thing that we built because in order to go to school, you need somewhere private to go to the mm. loo. Um, but yeah, so the school now is thriving uh, and there's 800 pupils. That's incredible. It must be so rewarding. Uh, yeah, I, going out there was yeah the most, I think until now, probably the most rewarding moment of my life when we went out there a year and a half ago because it just blows you away. Mm. You know, I guess we, you know, we're doing our, our adventures and raising money and you kind of think, oh, you know, this is, this is tough and we're doing something meaningful. But then you actually go out there and you're like, wow, this, this is life-changing. <laughs> this is life-changing. And, and so, you know, it really redoubles your passion for doing it. We're running out of time. There's so much to talk about. You've done so much. But then I guess the final question is, what's next for you? Because uh, I understand you've just finished your PhD uh, in Australia, uh, but you've achieved so much in your life. You know, what, do you, what dreams does a man who has literally travelled the world from end to end have next? Well, I guess... Um, for me, I want to have I want to have an I guess a positive impact on the world. That's if I have now I guess a, a raison d'être. Um, it, it's trying to make sure that me be, me being here and me having the opportunity to, to be alive hopefully results in kind of a net positive <laughs> impact on the world around me. And and of course that's that's a, an easy thing to say, but not necessarily an easy thing to do or to work out how to do. Um, and so what I've tried to do is just stick to. I guess my values, you know, and one of the things I care about is the environment. Um, and so I decided I'd do a PhD in, in environmental science. Um, and I guess what I'd like to find a way to do in the future is to kind of combine maybe my adventure with my science. <laughs> um, you know, I would love to do kind of maybe a popular science program or something like that. But I think um, basically I want to try and uh, encourage people to, I guess, think more um, about the various issues, both social and environmental, that, that affect us. And and obviously, hopefully try and, instead of just speaking about them, also, you know, through research, kind of try and find some solutions as well. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you here today. I, I think our listeners will be inspired by your words as well. And we look forward to seeing what else you achieve in your life as we go forward. Well, thank you very much.